Hello, everyone. I'm Art Taylor, the president and CEO of BBBsGive.org. Our aim is to strengthen the bond between donors and charities by helping donors make informed giving decisions and promoting high standards among charitable organizations. Our core work is engaging charities to produce reports based on the 20 standards for charity accountability. These standards cover charity governance, effectiveness reporting, finance, and marketing and communications materials. Our reports are available free of charge at give.org and bbb.org to help donors give with confidence. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. This is the first of a series of virtual interactive sessions we are putting together to connect and interact with experts and colleagues. We will be offering sessions in different focus areas and sizes, but always with the goal of creating a new space to explore new knowledge, ideas, and partners. The inspiration for today's topic came from donor research we conducted last year. We know donor attitudes are dynamic, and we want to measure these attitudes across time so we can keep an eye on important shifts and play a role in helping charities and donors thrive. With that in mind, last year, we released a new study titled the Give.org Donor Trust Report. In it are measures of donor beliefs and intentions related to charity trust and giving. The first donor trust report had many lessons. For example, we found that there is plenty of room to build trust in charities, with only 19% of people saying they highly trust charities, but 73% saying it is important to trust a charity before giving. However, what seemed to capture most interest from charities is the difference in attitudes across age and racial lines. For example, we know that younger and minority people are significantly more likely to say they would like charities to approach them more and might be willing to give more if charities approached. But we also know that charities can have a hard time reaching these segments and may feel like it's not cost effective. Because we know that understanding younger and more diverse rising generations is important to the future of our sector, we invited leading on the ground fundraising experts to share their insights with you. We're joined today by Adrian Sargent, Director at the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy, Rebecca Bowen, Executive Vice President and Chief Advancement Officer at YMCA of the USA, and Roxanne Rucker, Vice President of Community Impact at Kaboom. Adrian Sargent is a leading expert in the new science of philanthropic psychology, and he combines research and practice to ignite growth in giving. We are delighted to hear his insights on how to develop the new value that donors get from giving, and in particular, how charities might think about donors of different age groups and backgrounds. Adrian will deliver our main presentation today, but we are lucky to also be joined by Rebecca and Roxanne, who have agreed to more informally share their reactions and tell us a little bit about how they work to engage younger and minority donors. So Adrian, the floor is yours. Because it distinguishes people who give from people who don't. So if I have trust in the sector at large, it's much more likely then that I'll become a donor and I'll give to causes in that sector. If that trust is lacking, then again, it's less likely that I'll give. Why is that important? Well, because we know broadly that the donor population in the United States is contracting. We don't see it in the annual giving figures because the people who give, frankly, are giving more generously. But we need to find ways of being able to expand that engagement with philanthropy and building trust in our uh, sector and what we do and how we do it is massively important when it comes to that. Trust is also important because it drives donor retention. Now, I talked about trust in the sector distinguishing givers from non-givers, but trust in an organization is hugely important because it will dictate how long I continue to give to support the work of that organization. 
And fundamentally, there are three big drivers of donor loyalty. One is satisfaction with the quality of service provided by the fundraising team. So one of the big things that drives how loyal I am is how satisfied I am with the quality of service that you provided to me. Commitment is pretty much what it says on the packet, really. It's commitment to see the mission of the organization achieved. And people who feel more committed to the mission, much more likely to be loyal. Equally, trust, another huge factor. Uh, and the more that we trust that organizations are going to do what they say they're going to do, the more likely it is that I'm going to hang around giving next year, the year after, and so on. Now, when researchers have measured these things, often they measure them on seven point scales from really no trust at all, right the way through to 100% trust the organization. And if you think about these things measured on those seven point scales, pushing up my level of trust from say four to five or five to six, and doing the same for satisfaction and commitment, those three things together can increase the likelihood that donors will renew next year by 51%. Right. When Adrian says satisfaction, commitment and trust are hugely important, that's why. Right. Because relatively small improvements in those dimensions can really develop the loyalty of the supporter base. So trust is important. Um, what do we know about what drives trust? Well, you don't need a fundraising professor to sit here and say, you know, you need to provide feedback to donors about how their gifts are being used. We've kind of made that point already. It's hugely important. But it turns out that there are some other cute ways in which we can develop trust as well. Now, you can tell me that you helped a community in the developing world. Uh, but equally, you can explain to me how you were well placed. So if you're talking to me about the expertise, you know, the facilities that you've got, um, the expertise you've got on the ground, how things are kind of shaping up locally, you know, all of those things start to make me think, well, yeah, if they're doing all of that and they've got all that machinery in place, well, then they must be delivering that trust. So demonstrating that you, are, you have that kind of role competence, the potential to do those things, and a little bit of cognition that follows from that can also help build up trust. So too can demonstrating good judgment. Now, as human beings, we are immensely irrational. If you tell me about what you're doing with this little bit of service provision over here and the issues that you're wrestling with and the solutions that you've came to, I'm gonna think, well, that's really smart, right? These are fantastic people. They know exactly what they're doing. How wonderful are they? And I'll generalize away from those little tidbits of information to assume that therefore, what you're doing over there is equally smart. What you're doing over there is equally smart and so on. Of course, it's completely irrational. There's no reason why uh, necessarily you would be smart in all of those things. But we have that little shortcut that we take. So drip feeding into newsletters and websites, you know, illustrations of where you've maybe been dealing with something that's quite difficult. You've come up with these nice new solutions. All of that stuff helps build up trust. So too, does giving people a, a voice in terms of complaint handling. So if people have had an issue of some kind with the organization or there's something they want to raise with you, give them a point of contact so that they can do that. Some organizations kind of shy away from it because they think, oh, well, you know, we couldn't possibly meet all of the requirements and answer all of the issues that people might have. Well, even if you can't fix things, even if you haven't got a solution for that person, the fact that you gave them that opportunity to complain helps build up uh, the level of trust in the organization. So it's important. So too is familiarity. You know, the more comfortable we are with an organization's brand, the more we recognize that at work in our community, the more trust we experience because it's familiar to us. And the other big one in the context of talking about other generations of donors is similarity of values. And when people, particularly millennials, can see that they share a similar value base with an organization, that's immensely powerful in terms of driving engagement and subsequent donor loyalty. Now, it is not enough to simply reproduce your organization's values on the website, as a lot of organizations do, or to print them in the annual report. What you need to do is to give people opportunities to experience those values. So be thinking about things that we can do in the digital space that allow people to really see the kind of organization you are and to feel it. And that's much more believable than just simply reading words on a website. So that's trust.
<laughs> and I've said that when you're trying to get younger generations to give, you know, trust is a massively significant issue for them because they're worried about um, all, all of the kind of scandals and uh, misdirection and things that can happen in the digital space. So they have to be able to trust you. Now, apart from that, though, how do you get younger donors to give? Well, if I were being a little flippant, I'd say keep calm and carry on, right? Because actually, we uh, people have been worried about younger generations for as long as I can remember, and I'm seriously old now. Um, and you know, we were worried sort of 20, 30 years ago about how future generations were going to shape up into giving. And actually, we know from research that people do grow into it. It's taking a little longer to grow into it because we've saddled younger generations with an, a, a huge amount of debt um, in, a, in their student life and housing's going up and all of these costs are impacting on them. But now we're starting to see that actually the millennial generation are actually pretty generous. And, and currently they're responsible for about 11% of giving in the United States and that number is climbing over time. Why is it climbing? Because millennials are not that young anymore. Um, at the top end, you know, they're approaching 40 now. At the young end, they're in their mid-20s. So they're certainly beginning to ease into that space where it's a bit, uh, a bit easier for them to be able to give money away. Now, to do that, we know that we're going to do a, a few things that are a little different, really. One is that we need to get up close and personal with these folks. They're used to that degree of personalization uh, in the consumer market and when they're beginning to give to organizations. They're expecting we're going to talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis. There's no reason why we couldn't be developing survey tools as part of the donor welcoming and acquisition process that capture a little bit about their interests and who they are. And then we can feed that into the dialogue that we have with them subsequently. My advice generally um, to nonprofits is that they need to go where the donors are. And if the donors are technologically savvy and they're living in that digital space, then we've got to be prepared to talk to them in that space through the kind of media channels that they're used to talking to their friends and other business organizations through. We also want to capitalize on one of the fears that we know millennials have, um, which is the fear of missing out. And so when people do things for the organization, they get involved, they campaign, they volunteer or whatever, let's give them the opportunity to share that with others in their network who might also uh, engage with that. Let's show our appreciation in novel ways, not just the boring, bland, thank you for that kind and caring gift. Let's thank them for being the kind of person that they are with their philanthropy and do it in ways that are personalized and more meaningful. Let's also make sure that we are authentic in the way that we communicate. If we're telling people we are this kind of organization with that kind of values, then we need to make sure that we're being authentic with that in the way that we communicate. It's not just words on the page. They can feel it when they have contact with our organization. So there are lots of ideas there. Uh, and even if they're not giving to you at the moment, let's spend some time getting to know them and engaging them with the cause. If they are in their mid-20s, chances are they haven't got a lot of disposable resource to give away right now, but there's no reason why we can't fire them up with some passion about the work that we're doing, joining a group, becoming part of a movement, signing up for news, spreading the word about our great cause. All of those things can engage folks, and then when they're ready, maybe they'll also start giving to the organization as well. And my final thought kind of on those lines is that if you want millennials to give, let's engage them in ways that make them feel really good. Uh, I, I think sometimes organizations think about, well, what can the, what these people do for us, right? So what can millennials do to help our organization? Adrian thinks that's wrong. The right question to ask is what can we offer millennials that will feel good to them to participate in? And fundamentally, as human beings, we've got three core needs that fundraisers, I think, can attend to. We experience more well-being when we feel like we're connected to others. And the more connected we feel to others that we love or care about, the better we feel. And in fundraising, you know, there are ways in which we can, we can think about that. It, maybe it's beneficiaries that people want to be connected with, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's one group of beneficiaries. Maybe it's other donors or campaigners or volunteers like me. Maybe it's an outstanding and charismatic leader that's at the helm of this great organization. Or maybe it's just the brand or the organization itself 
or in the faith-based context, a God figure. And if we can engage people in activities that make them feel more connected, um, they'll experience more well-being. Very quickly, autonomy is about feeling that you have a voice um, and feeling that you've had a hand in making something good happen. Competence in the space of philanthropy is competence in articulating our love for others. And we can be designing events and things that people can participate in that really give them a sense of that autonomy and a sense of the fact that they are competent in articulating their love for others. And actually, the same points play out in the way that we would then solicit gifts from these individuals. Uh, too many organizations kind of think about fundraising. Well, there's beneficiary need over there. We're going to take that. We're going to craft that into a case for support. And we're going to put it out in front of people who might be willing to give. That's really the fundraising skill set right now. Adrian thinks that in the future, you're going to see more organizations think about how are we going to make people feel when we do that to them? And that's where those human needs come in. Now, let me give you one tangible example, and then I'll shut up. So my tangible example is Gillette Children's Hospital. And what you're looking at are two newsletters. One is a before and one is an after of when a chum of mine, Tom Ahern, got a hold of it. So on the left, you can see they're talking about a Gillette medical pioneers set the standards for spine care. And if you read it, it would drone on at great length about how fantastic the surgeons are, how brilliant the nurses are, how wonderful the facilities are. Um, will you give us $20? Mm, probably not. But I will give you a round of applause because obviously you're brilliant, right? <laughs> now, on the other side of the screen, you've got connections. And how smart is that? Because I just told you that connection with others we care about is a fundamental human need. This time, the note is a thank you letter from the little Tanzanian girl that you can see there, Zawadi. And she's thanking you because you made her operation possible. And you can see from the picture at the bottom of the screen, this little girl was born with both her feet pointing in the wrong direction. She could barely stand, much less walk. And thanks to you, this little girl can walk today. You put that beaming smile on that little girl's face. How competent do you feel now in articulating your love for others? How connected do you feel with that little girl? And as you read through it, you, you feel even more connected because you realize that something magical has happened to this little girl today. She has shopping bags. What's in the shopping bags? Shoes. Somebody has taken this little girl shopping for shoes today. And I have an eight-year-old daughter, I can tell you, shoes are important to eight-year-old daughters, right? And so you feel even more connected and good about yourself. So when Adrian says the future of fundraising should be to design opportunities that build that sense of connectedness, make people feel competent in articulating their own for others, that's what it looks like. And it may not be a newsletter, it might be an event or something else, but it's focused on that well-being. Now, in the trade, we know that newsletters are soft asks. We don't generally ask for money, but people send in money. At Gillette, medical pioneers raised an amazing $4,500. The thank you note from little Zawadi there, $49,600. Do the maths on that and tell me that the science of well-being is academic. That's a thousand percent increase by focusing on the genuine needs of supporters. And those needs will be different by generation. We need to understand how they're different and then develop engagement opportunities and giving opportunities that reflect the genuine needs of our supporters. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adrian. That was a very dynamic presentation. What I'd like to do now is ask Rebecca to unmute her phone if she could so that we could get her reaction to to your presentation and to and to also ask you to not only focus on it from the standpoint of your role at the Y but I understand you've also got some background in in the environment so there may be some remarks relative to that too and then we'll come back and get Roxanne. Sure thing thanks Art um, and thanks for the unmute. Adrian that was a tremendously um, powerful presentation. It's always valuable to me to see someone take ideas and um, shape them in a different way than I would. Um, and I will share with you that my assistance, my experience across multiple organizations is entirely consistent with what you put forward. I want to call out in particular the idea that trust is a belief, not a transaction, 
And it is in some ways a faith in a future in which you are going to satisfy my needs, not just your obligation to me as a donor, but my needs as a philanthropist. And so in light of that, let me try to share my screen and I'll give you my lens on the same thing. May I, may I take over the screen for a minute, you guys? Yeah. Can you see that? Can you all see my screen? I'll assume so. So this is the theory of the elephant and the rider, um, sometimes known as switch. It was created by a guy out of NYU uh, named Jonathan Haidt. He's a moral psychologist. Um, he does tremendous work on how people make decisions. And the rider and the elephant is sort of his central metaphor. So what it really comes down to is this. The rider is your conscious, verbal, thinking brain. And the elephant is your emotional, visceral, um, I feel a need to do this, or I feel a need to not do this um, piece of your decision making. And the beauty of this analogy, well, well, many people use it to describe change management initiatives. It's really quite beautiful for fundraisers. So let me give you a concrete example. In the, um, in the, don in the arts report on donor trust, um, donors are reporting that they need, and we've all heard this as fundraisers, there's a very strong interest right now and for about five years now in organizational impact metrics. And everybody's saying we have to get our organizational impact metrics together. And I would suggest to you that those are indeed important, but they're appealing to the rider here rather than the elephant. And I would ask you to just stop for a minute and ask yourselves which of those two entities, the rider or the elephant, is the bigger entity and the more likely to drive decision making for donors. So what does that have to do with trust? Um, it is the trust in the elephant that is going to allow you to ride that elephant or drive that elephant the way that you hope it's going to go. And the way that you're going to get there is indeed through authenticity, in particular through the way you communicate with different donor segments. And so when we're talking about um, any donor segment, but when we're talking about um, minority donors or younger donors in particular, who we tend not to be designed to ask, what you've got to be thinking about is, are your communications at all levels authentic to the way they think about themselves, the way they identify, the, the issues that they care about, the language that they use, and the vehicles that they use? And if I could make that more concrete, one thing I'd say, you know, just right off the bat is if you're thinking about a newsletter like the Gillette newsletter, the organizations that are really doing very, very well with younger donors are creating different newsletters going through different channels for different ages of donors because the imagery is different, the language is different, and the appeal is different, even though the basis around authenticity and trust are pretty much the same thing. The, um, here, I'll take, uh, can I give you your screen back? Or do you want to keep looking at the elephant? I'll give you your screen back. So here's the thing. The gift.org donor trust report to me is really very optimistic in a couple of ways because it's telling us that we are in actually quite a target rich environment. We can see that um, African American, Latino and Hispanic donors are in fact the most trusting of charities as a whole, dramatically more trusting than our traditional Caucasian donors are. We can also see that younger generations and racial minorities find trust easier to verify for themselves. And so what they tend to look for is not the writer kind of information, but rather the elephant kind of communicate uh, information, which is about storytelling. It's about impact. It's about connecting them to the end game of what they're doing rather than giving them necessarily a bunch of metrics around it. Though again, I'm not dismissing metrics. So if all of these categories, African-Americans, Latinos and Hispanics, presumably other ethnic groups, and also younger donors are telling us that they, ex they more frequently express a desire to be asked for a gift, it's incumbent upon us to ask them. If we're privileged to be the stewards of our organizational futures, and in fact also the means by which our donors express or facilitate their care for the world, it's kind of 
entails a responsibility for us to ask people who are asking us to ask them. And I'll stop there, Art, I think, until we get to a Q&A session. Great, so Roxanne, I know you've had a lot of experience, particularly working in the African-American uh, community and, and reaching out to engage that community. So I'd love to hear your reaction to the Dr. Trush report and, and Adrian's presentation as well, and, and probably to some of the things Rebecca had to say. Sure, thank you both, uh, Adrian and uh, Rebecca, for setting that uh, framing. Uh, what stands out most, uh, first off, let me just say a word or two uh, about Kaboom. So Kaboom is a national uh, nonprofit. Uh, we're best known for um, our work around uh, play and bringing play spaces to uh, underserved communities uh, across the country. What stands out most for me um, in, in thinking about uh, engaging younger and minority uh, donors is that word engaging. Um, at Kaboom, we've been uh, very successful in uh, bringing uh, millennials, uh, minorities uh, into our projects in meaningful ways. Our projects are rooted in community building and community engagement. Um, and in offering uh, a meaningful and relevant way to participate, we uh, have opened uh, the opportunity for continuing uh, dialogue and connection to our, our mission, uh, which may uh, eventually open the door to, uh, to giving. Uh, but the very first uh, interaction, the very first opportunity to, uh, to join, the first opportunity to align our values is around uh, that engaging, that volunteering, uh, that being part of a community activity um, that results in a long lasting change to uh, the physical infrastructure and to the community. Uh, you frequently will hear and we hear from uh, 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 millennials and um, other young participants on um, a desire to be asked, uh, a desire uh, and, and, and uh, to be asked to uh, join and participate, a desire to have a way to reflect uh, their voice in what's occurring in, in their world and in their community. Um, a desire to have their interests uh, show up uh, in the design and what's uh, eventually built. I think at times we um, tend to ignore or um, at least not in a directed, uh, assertive way, um, invite uh, uh, younger donors, uh, millennials to participate. But from what we've seen, there's uh, not only great interest, but when that hand is extended uh, more often than not, we are met with a strong positive response. That's terrific. Um, I want to begin uh, getting our audience to think about questions they may have as well. Um, but I have just a, a couple of quick questions I'd like to ask while um, the audience is queuing up theirs. Um, first of all, you know, we tend to think about the younger or millennial generation as one that is going to be very different than generations that we've seen when it comes to giving. Um, one of the big concerns that people have is that for many charities, direct mail tends to be a very significant piece of fundraising. And uh, there's a sense that uh, millennials don't pay a whole lot of attention to their mail. And so um, how are they going to actually be asked to give and thereby respond if they don't? So there's this, this question about whether um, in time, as millennials get older, they will pay more attention to their mail or whether they will never pay attention to their mail and we'll just have to find new ways of reaching them. I'm just curious about what your thoughts are about that. You wanna start, Roxanne? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, well, at Kaboom, we uh, engage in no direct mail. Okay. Uh, all of our 
uh, fundraising um, is done digitally, um, either uh, email uh, or on social media. And um, so, and, and our expectation is that that will continue to be the, the trend, um, and especially with uh, this younger generation. Great. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a strong direct mail program, I would by no means give that up. Um, it's still very, very effective fundraising with boomers and with older generations. And also as a fundraiser, you know, sort of my, my core belief is never interrupt the way people are already giving to you. However, I would agree with Roxanne. I mean, even Gen X doesn't read mail, much less millennials and much less the digital natives that are coming up in the Gen Z um, generation. So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you can have two completely different communication paths for different generations. And I think digital giving for um, younger generations, but also canvassing works very, very effectively. Um, there are all kinds of platforms out there where um, people can, communities can sort of self-build their own event or their own campaign to fund somebody. Um, I was with a small organization in my last iteration, it was a small Wildcat Conservation Organization, and we actually had DYI event, fundraising events up on the website that we did very well with. So someone would go looking to see who's saving tigers and they would see this opportunity to, you know, have their friends come together. They'd throw a party and all of a sudden the money was going to the organization I was working for. So it's, you know, it's not magic. Um, one of the things that I think is really uh, effective is to have counselors to your program that are of the generation you are trying to reach. Because the authenticity of vehicle and of language really is make or break. Um, in trying to reach different people. You know, we've been hearing a lot about authenticity as being a driver of success in fundraising and, and outreach. And uh, it made me think about how we are um, working to engage um, new Americans, so to speak, in our cultural um, activities, such as nonprofit organizations. And, um, I don't know how many organizations actually have web pages, for instance, that are uh, multilingual, multi, uh, for instance. Um, do, do you all think that could be uh, a helpful way of engaging um, particularly Hispanic audiences? Should we, flip, should we switch up or you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about that. Yeah. So. Um, I think absolutely we have to move in that direction um, and it certainly is um, something that's um, on our mind here at Kaboom. We um, haven't taken that leap yet, um, but we have in uh, some of the other channels uh, in the ways that we're reaching out to, um, to Hispanic communities and others. Uh, in a way that's uh, culturally uh, sensitive, that uses um, language um, uh, of that that's native to that community. Um, so it's, I think it's certainly something that we can uh, do uh, a better job at and are figuring out how best to, uh, to do that. Yeah. You no, know, Art, as, as an organization that has a physical infrastructure Kaboom has a physical infrastructure, but you guys don't stay there all the time. Um, yes. OCI feels a little different, so I'll share a story with you. I was in uh, Seattle two weeks ago with some of our board members visiting a Y that had been built, very deliberately been built in a community that was extraordinarily diverse um, and built in such a way that full paying members could subsidize the participation of members that couldn't afford it. A great Y, 135 languages spoken in that community and what they had done was bring Microsoft Translator into the YMCA. And mm. so it, said that it wasn't just a new American thing, it was a um, inclusion and connection thing. And so in this environment where it was very, very clear to anyone, both whether you needed the translator or just if you were observing it, that it was genuinely connecting people of very different backgrounds, it creates an extraordinary context for participation. And in fact, that why since it's been built has outperformed the otherwise in Seattle in terms of both um, rates of giving and rates of volunteerism. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, like, Google Translate, there's lots of stuff. Yeah. I, I have a, a couple of thoughts 
uh, on on this, um, and I understand the uh, why organisations are beginning to kind of segment their approach and develop uh, different web pages, different materials for different e ethnicities. Um, I suppose I have just a word of caution in there. Mm. Um, I think nonprofit organizations, by and large, are pretty good at understanding why people support their organizations. So in plain English, they're really good at understanding the motives that people have. What they're less good at understanding is what people are saying about themselves when they give to the organization. What bit of themselves, what identity are they articulating when they give to the nonprofit? Um, so rather than just make assumptions about, oh, they're giving because they're Hispanic or whatever, uh, I'd encourage organizations to stop and think about what identities might be in play um, and pick the ones that are most meaningful for folks and focus on adding value for that kind of identity. And of course, we have lots of identities. Uh, we have an identity as a, as a parent, in my case, as a teacher. Uh, we have an identity as a liberal or a conservative, uh, as a, a, a passionate person from Indiana or whatever it might be. Uh, and also we have other identities like a moral identity. And the kind of person that we are fundamentally is, is better for an organization to think about. Because once you understand that, you can design communications and activities that you know are going to appeal to that particular kind of person. And if you want to be really smart, not only do you design your communications to appeal to that kind of person, you also make people feel really good about being that kind of person and remind them just before you ask for money or ask for an action that they are that kind of person. And you do that usually in the response mechanism. Uh, and when you do that, we've seen effect sizes that are huge that can literally double giving when you do that. Fantastic. Elvia, I want to ask if we have any uh, questions from the from the audience that, that you might want to pose. Kate, do you see any hands that are currently raised? And I want to give you all an opportunity to do that. So it doesn't it doesn't sound like we have any raised hands, um, but I'll, I'll ask a couple of the questions that came in through text. Okay. Um, great. So one of the questions, let me pick a good one here. Um, how do you know that working on building trust with donors will pay off? And can you give us specific examples? Uh, I mean, Adrian, I think you did a good, you, you, you had a good example in your, in your, in your presentation, but I don't know, yeah. maybe Rebecca and Roxanne can build on some, uh, build on that a little bit. Um, um, so I guess, you know, if, if you're looking for data behind the role of trust in um, a giving decision, I think the material in Adrian's presentation was phenomenal. Yeah. And he probably has way more of it at his fingertips. Um, from an experiential perspective, um, you know, I, I would just sort of say that I think that's the fundamental thing that we do as development professionals, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, we, we, we plan it out and we call it moves management and we try to put metrics and science behind it, all of which is important and viable. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is having enough interaction that the donor believes that by make, taking this leap of faith, making this gift, this gesture, expression of confidence, not wrong word, of faith in you, that you are in fact going to satisfy their needs in that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else you would call what we do. Yeah. Um, we have another follow-up questions about engaging younger generations. Um, one of them is, what is the one most important people you can do to engage people under uh, under 30 um, and a related question is if, if you could think of in smaller um, fundraising departments do you have any recommendations that if you know if you have fewer resources how to best utilize that um, what are your your recommendations for that Lexan, you want to take it I'm, I'm sorry, Elvia, you broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that? 
Sure. Um, we have a couple of questions that are follow-ups on how to engage younger donors. So one of them is, if you're going after people who are 30 and under, what's the one thing that you would prioritize? And another is, if you have a smaller staff and you need to prioritize your resources, then what would be your priority um, in, in that respect? Right. And so one of the things we found um, successful, it kind of also relates back to the last question, was um, um, is to is around storytelling and uh, using stories as a way to um, elevate the values that we think also resonate with that target audience um, that we're reaching out to. And a, a good example for us was not too very long ago um, with a project that we undertook in Chicago. And uh, it was a very successful project with um, Chicago Cred, uh, part of the uh, Emerson Collective, and their mission is all around uh, reducing gun violence in Chicago. Um, both the, uh, perp uh, the perpetrators of violence and those who are most often the victims of violence. And I use that one because um, it's a topic um, that resonates, um, I, I think, with a lot of younger donors, um, the, the communities they live in, the cities they live in. Chicago has particularly been um, under assault, you could say, um, here uh, the last couple of years. And um, in our work with this uh, community, we were surprised to find, well, a couple of surprising things. One, that the gangs um, agreed to lay down their arms, but two, when they were asked, well, wh what do they want? Um, they asked for a playground for their kids. And there's, there's just a, 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 a striking amount of humanity that comes from one hearing that and being exposed to it um, and sharing that, that story. And so um, using, a, we, we, we have developed a practice of uh, sharing stories throughout our network um, and not all the time with the intention of uh, raising funds immediately, but instead uh, continuing to build that connection, uh, build that confidence, build that trust with, uh, with our donors. Um, but that in particular was a very successful uh, campaign for us um, that we think really resonated with the values of, um, of uh, younger donors and touched into a very topical conversation uh, that was occurring. I mean, I, 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 I have a theme here and I'll just repeat it. I think for younger donors or, um, you know, there are geographic difference, generational differences, all kinds of things. I would say, listen to them. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing you have to do, right? So. Um, if you want to understand what it is that mo is moving a 25-year-old to make a gift, you have to ask them. Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating approach. Um, and I just wonder how organizations today have the ability to, to actually hear their constituents, whether they be fundraisers or, uh, or donors or, um, or even people they're actually serving, you know. Social media and other means now have given us many great tools for listening yep. and understanding and hearing and engaging. And uh, I think this gives even smaller organizations the advantage that I think many larger ones used to have by virtue of the expensive survey, so to speak. You know, these things are now much more affordable than they used to be. Yep. So um, I think it gives all of us a much better chance of really understanding uh, what we um, are about, at least from the standpoint of our constituents and how to um, meet their needs in a customized way. Because a lot of what I'm hearing, it seems like uh, it's all about being able to customize an experience so that it speaks to a particular constituent. And even inside of the millennial group or inside of a particular ethnic or racial group, uh, you're not, you're going to see a lot less than a monolith. You know, you're going to see various ways of thinking within these groups. And 
I think the great thing is that when organizations can really learn what's going on inside of groups, uh, they can really get, get better. And uh, so um, feedback, right? Feedback is, is really important. Um, I, um, we have a, a couple of more minutes and I wanna give anyone an opportunity in the audience to, to engage with us here. Um, it may not be a question you have. It may be an experience that you wanna share with everyone here. These are interactive sessions and the idea is that we're learning from each other. So if there is a question, it looks like maybe there's one yep. um, from uh, Camille Solly um, asks, um, what about asking a few millennials to serve on a charity board of directors? Could involving them on this level of an organization perhaps help with designing how you do your fundraising? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. You know, that's an interesting question though, because we want younger people on our board, but I know from experiences that I've had, um, attracting younger people and getting them to serve in the way that we expect older people to serve can be very different. Um, from what we see, they can be much more focused on um, maybe not making a long-term commitment to serving on a board. So we have to think about that. Uh, they may have less flexibility in their work schedules to be able to participate. So we've got to think about that. And, um, and they may not have the same level of financial wherewithal that sometimes we hold board members to a high degree of financial commitment and we can't seem to always find that with younger people but um, we've got to make these accommodations, I think, if we really want to get them on the board. Art, there's a, um, YUSA has had a partnership with Kellogg Business School for several years now, five, six years now. And every year there is a, uh, an MBA candidate that serves as a fellow on mm -hmm. the YUSA board. It's valuable to the MBA ca candidate, of course, because it helps resume build and experience build um, for that kind of young leader. Um, but the way we manage it is that it's a one-year term and it's non-voting, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if I have to report my board giving stats, which I hate to do in a vacuum, but sometimes you have to do it, we no. just exclude the fellow because they're not actually a board member. No. Lots of ways to bring that voice in. And you could also think about a, um, you know, a task force of young professionals to advise you on your giving strategy for millennials. Yeah. Task force may be more attractive than a full board role. Why are you going to ask? Roxanne, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to offer something similar to uh, what Rebecca shared. Um, you, you may not want to bring them on to uh, the full board, but certainly uh, having a, an advisory committee or some capacity that they can um, serve that um, is aligned uh, with the board and board agenda. Um, and, and also thinking of it as a way to build a pipeline of future board candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really think that's an important um, comment to try to get to young people, because I think if we can engage them, then they're more likely to be long-term financial supporters. But it's very hard to just go out and ask people to give money and they don't have a real meaningful connection to what you're doing. And also, you know, we're hearing that um, different age groups tend to focus more on cause than they do organization. And as organizations, that's good news and bad news. It's great when they love our cause, but we need them to love our organizations too. And um, the only way you can create that loyalty seems to me is to actually involve them in some way in the work so that they can develop a real connection to it. So, um, there's some things to, to think about there as well. Looks like we have another question, and this may be the last one. Um, do, you have a, do you have a suggestion about how to get young people committed to volunteer? From Keith Thomerson. Thank you, Keith. Um, so <laughs> we probably have lots of suggestions. I see all of us thinking. Um, you know, the, the commitment, I find for young people, the commitment is largely about the length of time you're asking for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, you know, to ask a young person to um, join in building, join in two days of playground building is a physical activity with a time defined commitment. Um, and probably for a young professional, an easier thing to accommodate than board service might be. Um, but, but I'll tell you, I don't, I don't find young people any less willing to volunteer. It's just that the nature of the activity and the way you communicate with them about it changes. And in particular, I'd say again, you know, this idea that millennials and also Gen Z even more, like they really like to do things together. And so the degree to which you can design, even a small organization, can have that sort of DIY get together and do something opportunity that can be phenomenal. Um, uh, I don't know what else you guys, I, I would also point to, there's one organization I'm really intrigued by that you might want to take a look at. It's called do something.org. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are very focused on much younger than millennial kids, right? So I think their data is on kids from 13 to 20 or 21. Um, but it, what they are is an online platform that lets young people put their own campaigns and projects together. And some of them might be digital, and some of them might be let's go join Kaboom in building a playground around, you know, on this at this address next week. Yeah. But it's a really interesting model, and I'm, you know, there there is almost certainly a way to partner with the kids using give, give do something.org, not give.org, sorry, do something.org to, um, you know, have those young people recruit their own volunteers for your project. Great. I would well, also we have about a minute left, and uh, I want to just take a minute to thank, in a big way, um, our guests for sharing their insights. And I also want to thank uh, all of you who attended and participated in the session today. I uh, hope you uh, got something important out of it. Um, we really want your feedback. So um, please send Jay Rizzo, J-R-I-Z-Z-O, at give.org um, your feedback. Um, and you're also going to receive a short follow-up survey about this session so that we can learn from it. Um, and we want our gatherings to be of value to you. And, and so we need your feedback. And by the way, we have access to um, a huge um, network of, of knowledge and um, leaders in our sector who we can bring to you. So you let us know what you, what you would like to, to hear about and we'll put the session together for you. We want this to be, as I said, meaningful for you. We have a couple of sessions planned already. Uh, one will be the future of giving and closing the gap between donor intent and behavior. So the future of giving would be one and then closing the gap between donor intent and behavior. So be on the lookout for, for an invitation to attend those. And finally, um, to, you can go to give.org to get a wealth of information about, of course, the work we do. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, stay engaged with all of you so we thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.